Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Russell Matthews here, and today I have something interesting to show you. One of the biggest channels on YouTube just made a video covering some Canadian content, and they say some pretty interesting things. The channel is called Donut Media, and they have 4.23 million subscribers. And they just put out a video called What Killed All of Canada's Car Brands. If you're a Canadian, you probably know that the auto industry is one of the biggest industries in Canada and supplies thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs to Canadians. But lately, that super important industry has been diminishing. I live about a half hour east of Toronto, so I know tons and tons and tons of people who were heavily impacted when the GM closed down their production plant in Oshawa. And this seems to be the trend across all of Canada. There are plants shutting down left and right. And this trend is definitely not good for Canadians, no matter what line of work you're in. So today we're going to take a look at Donut Media's video, What Killed the Canadian Car Brands, and we're going to talk a little bit about what might be accurate and what might not be. Canada itself doesn't have its own major car brand. What's up with that? It's a bit weird to me that a nation that's so clearly capable of producing a vehicle for the mass market has no mass market vehicle. It's so funny that they're only showing Toronto in those clips. I mean, Toronto is not the only place in Canada. Full of its own. So why exactly doesn't Canada make their own cars? We're gonna take a look at why that is and how a secret deal may have sealed the fate of the Canadian car's extinction. Well okay, a secret deal. It's interesting that he says that Canada doesn't have any car brands. I mean, I know that we don't have any big names, but we do a lot of producing for those big names, and that's a big part of our economy, so I hope he gets into this sort of uh, information. Canadian car brands came into fruition in what's known as the brass era of the late teens and early 1920s, when cars and trucks had all the hinges, handles, and headlamps finished in brass trim. Canada had managed to cultivate 11 major automotive manufacturing marks, including Brooks, Grey Dort, McLaughlin, Chatham, Redpath, and several- Mmm, McLaughlin, that's the one I'm most familiar with. That's probably because it's from right around where I grew up. I actually went to high school right across the street from the huge estate that was owned by the McLaughlin family. Man, those guys were loaded. They had a bowling alley inside of their house. I remember going in there one time on a tour and I was like, man, can you imagine living like that? You'd probably recognize the estate because it was in that one Adam Sandler movie. Hello, Smiley. You're my friend. You're not my friend. Yee! Yeah, that fountain he was floating in was right across the street from my high school and it was on the same estate. But enough about that, let's get back to the video. Canadian auto companies were primarily based out of Ontario due to its close proximity to Detroit, home of Ford, Chrysler, and GM, AKA the big three. Yeah. When there was that major recession in the 2007-2008 timeline, Detroit absolutely got rocked and its auto industry didn't help it out that much. As a result, the Canadian auto industry was heavily impacted also. If you remember, this launched a huge controversy in Canada when the Canadian government offered to bail out these auto industries with $3.3 billion of Canadian taxpayer money. Along with this bailout, there were a bunch of other strings attached that was designed to help keep the businesses in Canada so we wouldn't be wasting our money. That's why so many people are pissed about the auto industry moving out of Canada and going to other countries. We paid you money to stay in our country and to provide us with jobs and now you're ditching us? I think they were rightly upset. By 1923, Canada was the second largest automaker in the world. Mm -hmm. However, the industry as a whole struggled with inefficiency. Canada also had high tariffs on all trades to the US. When the Great Depression hit, it crippled the independent auto industry. By 1931, 75% of all Canadian car companies went belly up. Okay, that makes sense. That must be why there aren't any huge original car brands that are from Canada. It must have been the Great Depression. Because of the tariffs with the states, these car brands died and uh, weren't resurrected by the Canadian government. The big three stayed in Canada because they were already using Canadian factories to build American models. Mm -hmm. This also gave them access to British nations as well because Canada was part of the British Empire. This relationship remained largely unchanged for the next several decades, with American cars being produced in Canada and mostly being shipped back to the US for sale. Because That's pretty interesting. 
The main takeaway there is that the U.S. actually strategically kept companies in Canada so they could access the rest of the British Empire. It's so easy to forget how closely tied Canada is with Britain. I mean, technically, the highest power person in the Canadian government is the Queen. Now, at this point, it's kind of just for show, and it never really affects Canadian politics, but it's still an interesting fact. In 1964, Canada and the U.S. got together to address the money issues that had developed. What resulted was something called the Automotive Products Trade Agreement of 1964, better known as the Auto Pact. Before the Auto Pact, post-World War II prosperity had jump-started car sales all over North America, but Canadian manufacturing plants couldn't keep up with demand. This resulted in less business between the US and Canada, which was bad for Canadian makers and dealers. Solving this problem was the founding idea of the Auto Pact. Since there were basically only big American car brands that still existed in Canada when the Auto Pact was created, the cars getting produced for the American market and the cars being sold to the Canadian market were basically all US models. That's actually pretty interesting. I didn't really have that much knowledge about this Auto Pact, but it seems like a pretty good idea. The US needed more cars and they wanted to make regulations that allowed for Canadians to make more cars and uh, develop their economy as a result. Man, remember back in those days when different countries could uh, talk to each other and actually come up with win-win situations? It seems like that's uh, pretty tricky these days. Canada got rides like the Acadian Conso. Acadian was a Canadian sub-brand of GM and got sold through Pontiac dealers, and it was kind of a beast. Ford followed suit with their F-Series line of trucks, rebranding the vehicle as a Mercury, and Ford sold Mercury-badged F-Series trucks to Canadians, simply replacing the F with an M and calling it a day. Ford did this again. Huh, I wonder why they did that. Like, did they want to trick Canadians into, like, this being a different brand than Ford? I mean, I why wouldn't you just, like, leave it as the Ford F-Series? I'm guessing they rectified this situation because I'm not seeing any Mercuries on the road today, or at least I don't notice them. Instead, everyone's just cruising around in their F-150s. A Ford Falcon with a boatload of maple leaves plastered all over it in an all-new grill. Heck, even the hubcaps had maple leaves pressed straight into them. It's awesome. No way. In the first... So they just put maple leaves on it and said, hey, that'll sell for Canadians. I mean, a lot of Canadians are pretty patriotic, but right now I wouldn't buy a car that just had a bunch of maple leaves all over the grill and the hubcaps. I'm curious how well that car sold back in the day. Have you ever seen one of these with the maple leaves on the tire spinning around? <laughs> Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. The pact was proving its worth and helping to create a more robust and lively automotive market in Canada. It actually worked. Between 1966 and 1977, the money-centric relationship between Canada and the US ping-ponged its favor back and forth and eventually grew to a US surplus of just over a billion dollars. This also perpetuated the auto industry to become the number one export industry in all of Canada, employing over 100,000 people across the country. This that's huge. 100,000 people employed is a big deal. Between the auto manufacturing industry and the oil and gasoline industry, it, these things paired together to make a pretty robust economy for Canada at the time. That seems like ages ago, though, because if you've been following the news, both of those industries aren't doing very well in Canada anymore. Instead, we've seen more of the economy transition into the commercial banking world and some tech startups. There have been huge debates among politicians on what to do with people working in the oil and gas industry. With more and more people thinking of environmental concerns and the price of oil going way down, it's a struggling sector right now. People are wondering, how do we repurpose this industry to take us more into a more forward-thinking route? Or do we even repurpose it at all? Should we be building these pipelines to get Canadian oil to more places to stimulate our economy? These are actually some of the biggest questions in Canada right now. But most of them have been kind of brushed under the rug as of COVID. The benefits help so many other aspects of Canadian life, like the workforce, technology, advancements and a booming economy. Other nations took notice of the auto pact and started their own relationships with the Canadian workforce. Foreign manufacturers glomming on to the booming Canadian automotive manufacturing industry wanted to get in on that sweet Tim Hortons Wayne Gretzky coffee, <laughs> which if you didn't know is a coffee with nine sugars and nine creamers because Gretzky's number was 99. So is that a thing? I haven't heard of that. Everybody knows the classic Timmy's Double Double. Uh, that's a little bit sweet for me. I like my coffee black, but nine creams and nine sugars? That sounds like a heart attack in a cup. Could you imagine having a coffee like that every single day? The amount of sugar, man. 
It's also known as a cup of pure energy. We should harness it to power our grid. <laughs> Through the 70s, Honda, Isuzu, and Toyota gained presence in Canada. They weren't part of the auto pact, but this didn't stop these Japanese companies from taking up more than 16% of the market in Canada and the United States, all on their own by the mid 80s. Canada made a separate agreement with these Japanese companies in the form of something called a duty remission incentive, which essentially removes any That's taxes smart. on products that were imported into the country. The side effect of this was very interesting and kind of weird. Because Japanese automotive manufacturers set up shop in Canada, Canada was able to tie them into the duty-free exports to the United States so long as those huge. Japanese cars were Canada-made. Pretty cool. That's a huge deal. That's either pretty shady or some very smart business. That's what businesses tend to do. They look for these loopholes that allow them to make their companies more profitable. That's why new economic policies that are created have such a wide ranging impact. You never know what's going to happen. Like with the auto pact, it brought in Japanese uh, car manufacturers and created even more jobs for Canadians. Often we just look at what's right in front of us and what's going to happen tomorrow. But we need to be looking at more of the implications of these policies so that we can have a better idea of what it's really going to do for us or ruin for us down the line. Because Canada Canada wasn't technically violating any of the stipulations of the auto pact, it was allowed to continue with their middleman status and keep a steady flow of foreign cars built in the Great White North and then sold to the US. In 1989, the Free Trade Agreement came into effect, which got rid of any tax costs between Canada and the US That's for nasty, all cars right? and car parts while still maintaining that one-to-one -one production Maybe to sales not. ratio. But because of the now frictionless movement of product between two nations, you know, frictionless, it largely benefited US-based companies because of them being so much larger and having better technology than essentially any company that had a presence in the entire continent. The auto pact was canceled in 2001, but it didn't matter because trade minimums were already well above the one-to-one -one minimum. Canada had become the go-to manufacturer for a large portion of the big three's catalogs, as well as for Honda and Toyota. It's so interesting how a few different changed rules made so many uh, manufacturers come to Canada especially the Japanese. If you haven't heard the story, and I may get it wrong, but essentially there was uh, not much economic development going on in Japan, but all of a sudden they adopted this new method for making cars that put an emphasis on quality. By meticulously focusing on the quality, that's what built up those car companies and made them some of the biggest in the world. As a result, the resale value of these cars, everybody knows the Honda Civic, Toyota Corollas, these Japanese cars last a long time, and as a result, their resale value is very, very high compared to other brands. Even though Canada largely caters to the big boys in the automotive realm, there are still some smaller and very unique, and I think pretty cool, Canadian car companies. Prevost is a Canadian tour bus and motorhome company, and words. the machines they make are impressive to say the least. They're literally some of the largest vehicles wow. allowed on the road. There's the H345 VIP, which is 45 feet long with 500 horsepower, making 1750 foot pounds of torque. It's a big boy. Another cool can That's some luxury. It seems like all of these cars that are produced by Canadian car brands are all just sort of aimed at niche markets like that big uh, that big luxury RV. You probably don't have to sell too many of them to make a pretty sweet profit. My personal favorite car that's currently being produced in Canada is made by a supercar company called Felino. Oh, wow. Their CB7 and CB7R supercars are powered by a 6.2 liter LS V8. Nice. The CB7R is the race spec variant and it can produce 700 horsepower. The company was started by Canadian race champion Antoine Bessette in 2010 and they've been building bespoke track day machines for clients since 2017. This thing looks awesome. It looks like something out of science fiction. But don't forget though, we also- That's pretty cool. I didn't even know that that company existed. I guess that racer must have been in Formula One. As a kid, I followed NASCAR, not as much Formula One, but I know that lots of people in my family are really invested in the Formula One series, so that they must know about this brand. Ultimately, Canada forsake its own independent automotive industry for the ability to provide a more robust and fruitful workforce for the people that live and work in Canada. And in a way, that's the most Canadian thing I've ever heard of. Yeah, it seems like we sort of cut out the knees of our having our own Canadian car brands, but just the fact that we had these other major players come in and create these jobs was huge for the Canadian economy. And that's it for this video, but they really sort of set this up in a positive light. 
I wish he had dove more into exactly what was going on today. Canada has multiple industries that are failing. The auto industry and the oil industry are really struggling. You'd think that that sort of economic discussion would have worked its way into this video somewhere. But yeah, all around, I think Donut Media did a pretty good job with this video. I definitely learned something and I hope you did too. But I wanna hear something from you guys. Is there anybody in your family or any of your close friends who have ever worked in the auto industry in Canada? Let me know, were they affected by the recent changes in the shutdowns of plants in the, over the past couple of years? Let me know down in the comments. And while you're down there, make sure to click that like button and turn it blue. It's shown that just one click of that button could share this video with tons of people. I know that I would sincerely appreciate you helping me grow this channel, bringing information that could affect Canadians' money to them. And of course, if you haven't already, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. I post videos on this channel covering tons of Canadian news and information that could affect you and your family's money. The overall goal is to get this accurate information to you as quickly as possible so you can set yourself up to live a more wealthy future. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, then make sure to hit those buttons down there. With all of that said, thank you so much for watching everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did, and I'll see you next time.